Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome New York Times staff writer Emily Bazelon and panelists Alexandra Brodsky, Sharon Potter, and David Rudofsky. It is such a pleasure to be here um, with all of you this morning and with this fabulous panel. I'm so grateful to all of you for coming. So we are here to talk about campus sexual assault at a time of tremendous change and attention to this issue. To take a step back, five, ten years ago when I started writing about this issue, it just really was not on the radar. Then we had um, a swell of very ardent, fervent, um, effective activism from students, um, Alexandra among them. And a response from the Obama administration really drawing on Title IX to push schools to do more um, to adjudicate and prevent campus sexual assault. Title IX um, is a statute that was passed in the 70s. We used to think of it as um, being about sports. But what it's really about is equal access to education. And so I think one of the kind of fundamental questions here is, how do colleges, with the help or the mandate of the government, figure out how to handle campus sexual assault in a way that promotes equal access to education? So Alexandra, I want to start with you. Um, this is a question I know you get a lot. I know I get it a lot when I write on this topic. Why are schools trying rape cases? Why should schools be the focus of dealing with campus sexual assault? Why isn't this an issue for the police and the criminal justice system only? Sure. I mean, I think it's really understandable that so many people hear rape, hear sexual assault, and immediately think of the criminal law. They think of law and order SVU. Uh, but it, actually, we have a long history of civil rights law addressing gender violence in the institutions that are closest to our hearts. So uh, probably everyone in this room has been through some kind of HR training about sexual harassment. And that's because we recognize that sexual harassment and assault against uh, employees is a violation of civil rights law. Uh, similarly, in the education context, we recognize that uh, violence against students uh, keeps them from learning the way that we most want them to engage on campus. And I think that there's sort of like the technical legal reason why we think about uh, gender violence as discrimination, but I think that often the most intuitive way to think about it is that it's really, really hard to learn when you are sharing a library with your rapist. It is really, really hard to engage fully with campus life and meet new peers and you know, dive into your classes when you're sharing a dorm with your abusive ex. And that's why we ask employers and we ask schools to take steps both to prevent violence and to respond to violence after the fact. And that ends up getting uh, combined with something that employers and schools already do all the time, which is to sanction people within their community. Um, so while schools and employers provide accommodations to uh, survivors of gender violence, you know, a school will uh, provide a dorm change or provide tutoring, uh, they also suspend students or expel students very rarely, but theoretically they suspend students and expel students who perpetrate gender violence uh, to make sure that all of their students can learn safely. Um, and it's important, one thing I just sort of want to note at the start of this conversation is that while we've been talking publicly a lot about uh, school discipline in the context of gender violence, schools kick people out all the time for things other than raping their classmates. So schools kick people out for plagiarizing. Uh, and so I want to sort of keep that wider focus as we talk about these issues. Um, um, so let me turn to Sharon for a minute. Uh, Sharon, you're a researcher thinking a lot about the prevention part of this puzzle. It's certainly not the only piece, but it's part of it. What can schools do to try to help students have a culture in which there is less campus sexual assault or even an end uh, we can imagine to this problem? What are you doing at the University of New Hampshire that seems like it's effective and um, has a good chance to help students? So just to step back, as a researcher, when I think about campus responses to sexual assault, I think about it as a pie with three large pieces, and they're equal size. And the first piece is we need responses that support victims that are trauma-informed. We also, on the second piece, equally large pie, is um, responses that ensure due process for the accused. And then the third piece of the pie is comprehensive prevention strategies that engage faculty, staff, students, their families, and alumni. Uh, 
And most of my research has been looking at bystander intervention strategies. And bystander intervention work really draws on the social scientists who examined the aftermath of the Kitty Genovese um, brutal attacks and murder. And we don't, we, they looked at why did people not intervene? And just to really smush this huge body of um, research, there's three reasons that we know why bystanders intervene. And the first reason we know that they, when they intervene, is if they feel that they can acknowledge the situation and know if something is wrong. They also intervene when they feel confident they have the skills. And thirdly, they intervene when they can make a difference. And at my research center, we have two um, scientifically evaluated evidence-based um, research strategies, bringing in the bystander and in-person program and the Know Your Power bystander social marketing campaign. And from our evaluation, we know that participants who go through our program or who are exposed to our campaign can identify and safely intervene in situations where sexual assault is about to occur, is occurring, or after it's occurred. So in training our participants, we talk about common situations, and we talk about the most common situation, a party. And we know students know something's not right, so an intoxicated person is kind of being moved upstairs. And those bystanders know that they can go up to the intoxicated person, offer her a glass of water, or just quietly they can disrupt the situation by turning on the lights or by loudening the music or t turning off the music. And what bystander intervention really does is it challenges these social norms where in the past, you know, students know this goes on all the time and they kind of roll their eyes and look the other way, but now they have the skills to be able to intervene and help their friends. And the other place where we spend a lot of time with bystanders is we know from the research that when a victim, a student is a victim of sexual assault, before he or she goes to the authorities or the administration, they tell their friends or they tell their roommates. And how that victim is responded to has huge implications for how they process the crime in the aftermath. So just by a bystander saying, I'm really sorry this happened to you, I believe you, has so many more implications for how that victim heals. Um, so bystander intervention is a really important tool of getting um, students involved in, in um, the problems of sexual assault. It also really moves away from looking, categorizing people as a victim or a potential perpetrator. And it also go, does away with a lot of victim blaming. And generally, men tell me that it really re takes them off the defensive. So, that, so those are some of the reasons I really um, am, am impressed with the bystander intervention strategy. So one way to think about this is that it's on all of us to prevent this problem as opposed to the people who are directly involved. Right. Um, so to switch gears a little bit, David, you were part of a group of Penn Law professors who wrote and signed a letter expressing some concerns about what Penn is doing at the behest, we should say, of the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Education um, to kind of amp up enforcement of Title IX. And I wonder what the kind of due process concerns um, yeah. you have so are. Th th and I want to address that due process, but uh, let me just say that there's a lot of agreement, um, even though we dissented from what the Office of Civil Rights was uh, imposing in terms of the uh, requirements for a hearing, uh, everybody who signed that letter at uh, Penn Law School agreed with a lot of what was said about prevention, uh, uh, giving uh, uh, confidentiality and privacy to victims when they, when they complain. But uh, here was our concern. Um, um, and for many years, I've been head of the disciplinary panel uh, at Penn Law School. We deal with all those issues. We expel students. We suspend them for a whole variety of reasons. I've represented students on both sides complainants uh, in these cases and students who've been accused. Uh, and for many years, we've had a system under which we've had kind of full due process. Uh, both sides are entitled to be represented by counsel. Uh, there's a hearing. There's a five-person uh, panel, faculty and students uh, on the panel. Uh, there's right to cross-examination within limits, uh, depending on the nature of the case. Uh, and we think we've gotten a fair adjudication process. Very few cases reach that. Uh, most cases get resolved one way or another before the hearing, but sometimes there's, a, there's an issue. Um, uh, I didn't do it, yes, you did do it. Uh, and that's gotta be resolved, uh, and it ought to be resolved in a fair way. Um, and, and we think we had established a, a fairly reliable and fair way of doing that over the years. 
all of a sudden, uh, the Office of Civil Rights comes in and says, you've got to change the way you do it. University-wide, um, uh, no longer can you have a burden of proof of clear and convincing evidence. It's only preponderance of the evidence. Uh, there are going to be limits on what lawyers can do. Um, a lot of changes which reduced the protections for the accused student. Um, and uh, we looked at that and said, uh, why, why would we change? We've got a system that works. We've got a system that's fair. Just because we've got now a problem that many people are starting to recognize that we didn't recognize before, um, and whatever the extent is, whether it's 20 percent of, of, of students who are subject to assaults or 5 percent, it's a huge problem. Uh, that's a big problem out there. Uh, but why dilute the very protections, the fairness that we've had uh, in this proceeding? Um, therefore, Harvard uh, faculty did the same thing. Uh, we had about over a third of the faculty uh, write a letter objecting to what the university was about to do because they were going to impose it on all the schools uh, in the university uh, and just made the fundamental point that if somebody's accused and faces expulsion, and expulsion with a stigmatization, right, if you're a sexual predator, um, that's a serious matter. Uh, and we ought to get the factual part right if we actually go that far to a hearing. Uh, and that requires advice of counsel. You're dealing sometimes with 18, 19, 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds. Uh, uh, it requires at least some kind of cross-examination and confrontation. Um, you just can't expect that just because somebody says something, that's the truth. Uh, we don't accept it in any other part of our system. And my, my final point on that is, is when, I, when I started to think more broadly about that, uh, as opposed to this just one situation, often in our history, at times of what I'll call kind of moral panics, um, uh, we tend to do things we shouldn't do, uh, right? Um, so whether it's the Japanese internment during World War II, whether it's the way we dealt with accused communists in the 1950s, right? Uh, whether it's the way we deal with alleged terrorists now, right? Um, what's the response that the country makes? Well, it's too big a problem. It's too dangerous. We can't have the rights and the protections we normally have. Uh, we've got to cut back. We've got to take away this right. We've got to take away that right. Because if we give them the rights, we're not going to be able to solve the problem. Um, historically, what we found is every time we've done that, uh, we've been wrong. Uh, uh, we've injured people. Um, and, I, and, and my concern is that this is another moment um, where there is a, a legitimate concern about an enormous amount of sexual uh, violence and its assaults on campus. I know it. I, I speak to victims. I, I speak to students who are accused. Um, uh, but we can handle that, uh, I think. And, and the disciplinary part is really the, the, the back end, right? I mean, that's, you know, very few cases get there. It's much more important to talk about policies and prevention and, uh, and changing the culture, which colleges have been uh, not good at doing. Uh, but when we get to that point uh, where, where so much is at stake, we ought to do it consistent with due process and fairness uh, within our system. Um, Alexandra, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, I was like 75% with you until you got to the moral panic part. Um, <laughs> I think that we should be worried about uh, women's access to, access to education on college campuses, um, and I don't think it's an overreaction. Uh, I, I guess what I would say, where I'm with you 100%, is that I think it's a huge mistake when we respond to these concerns about process and student discipline by saying, it's not incarceration, it's just education. Because if it's just education, why are we so worried about Title IX, a civil rights education law? Um, I think that there are, I see sort of two troubling pieces here. Um, one is that I think going back to my earlier um, comment about how we immediately think of the criminal law when we think about sexual violence, I see a lot of critics criticizing student discipline for not looking like a trial. So there was a law professor at my school who wrote an article uh, calling student disciplinary panels uh, uh, rape trials. And if you're looking for a rape trial, student discipline is absolutely failing, but it's not a trial. It's an internal community deliberation about what's acceptable on our campus. Uh, and in fact, the Supreme Court has said that, you know, speaking about due process, that the process that is due on a college campus is not that from a criminal trial. You don't have to have cross-examination. You don't have to allow a student who has just been raped by a classmate to be aggressively questioned by him directly. We can think of creative ways to get around questions like those. We can think about, uh, and this is an idea that I proposed in an article in the American Prospect, we can think about one student uh, submitting questions to the disciplinary panel, which then separately at, sort of uh, chooses which questions are appropriate and asks those. And some schools are doing things like so that. So some schools are doing, and that's actually what the Harvard, what Harvard Law School ended up doing after these professors uh, presented 
uh, their, their objections. I guess the other thing I would just flag is that we have a really bad history in this country in our courts and in our schools of reserving a special kind of skepticism for rape victims. Uh, so when I hear about you know, how we need to have a higher burden of proof for students who complain about sexual assault rather than other kinds of disciplinary harms, I get really nervous. And I am really excited for a collaborative conversation between uh, victims' rights advocates and uh, advocates for accused students about what precise policy we should have. But I think we need to go into that, sort of freeing ourselves from this mythology of the, the woman who cries rape, uh, you know, hiding amongst us, ready to seek her revenge when a guy doesn't call her back the next day. Um, so we're about maybe four or five years into, I think, the, uh, this more visible conversation in the culture. Really, the Obama administration um, started taking a stand in 2011, and there's been enormous activity since then. To me, this feels like a conversation that is still in its early stages. Um, it's got getting lots of play, but I think the solutions, the answers to some of the questions you're raising collectively are still, um, we're, we're still in, in the middle of figuring them out. So when you kind of survey the landscape, Sharon, and how it's changed in the last few years, what do you find heartening in this particular moment um, compared to a few years ago, and what do you still worry about? So what I find heartening is I've been in this field one way or another since I was a freshman in college about 30 years ago. So it's really um, exciting to see um, national attention being focused on a problem whose prevalence rates have not changed since the early 80s when these prevalence studies were first um, published. Um, we know antidotally, and now there's some research projects looking at it, that we know that young um, men and women who are victims of rape will often leave school for periods of time, they'll change majors, they'll change career ideas. So that's a huge, it's not only a retention issue for universities, but it's a huge loss of human capital for our society. So from that point of view, I'm thrilled that this issue is getting attention. But I do have to tell you where I like, where if you were in my research office and you would hear me screaming regularly, is you as all as administrators, probably your snail mail and email boxes are filled every day with offers for you to just check the box on this problem and make it go away, right? The one and done solution. And there's all these um, people trying to make a buck off this. Snake oil. Yes, and it's crazy. And, and I guess what's disheartening to me is a lot of these um, programs are really slick. They look nice, but they're not based in the research. They haven't been evaluated. And in some case, they're just perpetuating the same rape myths in our culture that have been going on forever. So that's so when there's money to be made, uh, people come out of the woodwork. Yes. David, how about you? A heartening development and one something you still find yeah, So no, I, I, I think heartening just in, in the last few years that this issue has surfaced. Uh, it's been there for, for many, many years. Uh, we've ignored it. Uh, college administrators have, uh, have often ignored it. Um, and, and I'm not talking about the hearing process. I'm talking about you know um, what, how we deal with that, how we change a culture uh, that's now embedded. Uh, a lot of it related, we were talking before, alcohol and drugs. I'm stunned. <laughs> I'm not a prude. I'm stunned by the amount of drinking uh, that goes on at campuses. Um, uh, and, you know, that, that's, a, that's a volatile mix. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's, a, that's a dangerous mix. And the attention that's being paid to that is positive. Uh, as I said, even at Penn, where we've got some disagreements over process, there's a lot of agreement as, as to what you do to try to prevent and, 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 and uh, deal with students as they come in and, and, and build in a, a try to change some of that culture, very, very difficult. So uh, uh, that part is good, I think. Uh, I am uh, somewhat dismayed uh, about how many schools have just accepted the orders from uh, the federal government and said, well, this is the way you're gonna run it. And you know, in Alexander, it's, it's not that I want a different process for sexual assault investigations or disciplinary hearings. Um, I want the same one. Um, uh, whatever the same burden of proof is, whatever the same rights are, I don't know why we would distinguish between a hearing where it's a physical assault, not a sexual assault, or whether it's a hearing on plagiarism or a whole lot of other kind of misconduct um, on campus. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I think uh, we, we've got to be aware on both sides. And, and, you know, I'm not talking about a criminal trial. We're not talking about a jury. We're not talking about proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And we run it in a way that lawyers can't intimidate. You know, you've, you've got to run it fairly, but you, you, you run it with, with a strong hand so that the uh, complainant, the victim, is not intimidated, right? So that they feel they're getting a, a, a fair hearing. You can do that. Um, and, and, and I think 
That's the part that I still have some dismay about because I think we're, we're going down a, a wrong road here. Um, so, Alexandra, a few years ago, you brought an early Title IX complaint with uh, some other um, Yale students against Yale University. And Title IX complaint in the sense that you were saying the university was not properly handling sexual assault and harassment complaints at that point. Um, do you feel more hopeful about changes that have taken place since then? Um, where do you think we are kind of on the spectrum of change? Yeah, it's interesting. I feel sort of, uh, I'm 25, but I feel sort of old for this movement now because you things are. have changed so much <laughs> um, in just a couple of years. Uh, look, I think that when we made our complaint against Yale, and this was in 2011, the school simply did not care about this issue. Um, this was sort of a, uh, a box to check off uh, very easily because, in part, because the federal government uh, wasn't uh, really holding schools to their civil rights responsibilities. Uh, I think that the issues have changed now. I think that part of the problem is that schools have activated to do something, but what they are doing is looking for a perfect checklist of what they can do at the least cost and with the least disruption um, in order to keep their name out of the headlines with a OCR complaint. So I guess I'm hoping, and this is tricky to do, and I'm a law student, so I don't really have any ideas for this, but how can we shift this from an issue merely of legal compliance to one of, uh, ethical responsibility to ensure that all students, whether they are bringing a complaint of sex discrimination or they are on the, the receiving end of a complaint, um, can uh, have uh, fair and equal access to education. Um, so I, we're almost ready to take some questions. I'm going to share um, a frustration of mine as a journalist covering this issue. We have very little data, um, really no national data, about how many students come to schools, try to initiate the complaint process, what kinds of finding those schools make, and what kinds of punishments they impose. And so I have this question, which is maybe a good question for this audience. Um, how much are things actually changing on the ground? You know, as you said, in 2011 and before that, it felt on many campuses that there was a lot of sweeping under the rug. Not necessarily with bad intentions. I think schools were somewhat <laughs> we might disagree about the benefit <laughs> of the sure. doubt. I think to some degree um, schools were uh, confused, flummoxed about how to handle this. Maybe they should have gotten their act together, um, but they hadn't. Now we're at a moment in which they are much more aware that they have this responsibility, and yet I'm just finding it impossible to judge um, in any kind of national way whether, in fact, there are more students um, being um, found responsible for sexual assault and being seriously punished, or whether we're still at a moment in which schools are not actually taking those actions. Um, and when we're talking about the investigation and adjudication part of this, that is like a key unanswered question. Um, all right, I think we're ready to take some questions if Charles. Let me start with out. one that, that we've gotten a couple of questions on uh, that have been emailed in, which is a lot of the conversation has focused on the adjudication process that presumes that there's some understanding of whether an assault happened or not. Obviously, much of the conversation that happens on campuses, and just out of curiosity, how many people in this room deal with, have dealt with this issue in the last year on your own campuses? It's a huge, it seems like something that when I talk to college presidents and others that I hear a lot about. Why should we believe that universities, whether it's UPenn and faculty, or whether it's students serving on adjudication processes, why should we believe that universities are better at determining whether consent occurred than a uh, exterior court system that we know is robust and has at least dealt with these questions in a more sophisticated or at least longer ter period? Can I take you one? want to start with that? would say that we don't. Um, so there's no point at which a student who makes a complaint to their university cannot also make a complaint um, either in uh, civil court or in a criminal court. Uh, I think instead what we're talking about is different kinds of remedies. And in some ways a university, first of all, universities already do adjudicate lots of different tricky questions in student discipline and have for years. Um, and I also think that there's a tremendous opportunity for a university to decide what are our values as a community? What standards are we going to hold each other to that in some ways match up with the law, but not, not entirely? Um, and then to go through that deliberative process together. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, so I, I would add, add two things. Uh, I agree. The schools that have some responsibility here, prosecutors are not going to prosecute many of these cases for the obvious reasons. Uh, <clears throat> I think a complainant ought to have that choice <clears throat> and go to a prosecutor if necessary. <coughs> the other problem is um, I think schools have been um, 
uh, lacks in really defining what is consent. I mean, one of the problems here is we get a whole debate about what is consent. Is it no means no? Is it yes means yes? And so you, it, it, the whole area becomes even murkier. It, and so I think, I think we've got to work both at that uh, fundamental point about what the rules are uh, and then the adjudication process it, itself. To push back a little bit on that, though, it, it is true that schools for years, decades, have adjudicated a number of issues that come up and dis determine whether it's something wrong happened. The, accusing someone of sexual assault or of rape is very different than accusing them, particularly in today's climate, of accusing them of cheating on a test. Right? We know that there's reputational damages, particularly in the climate that's on many campuses today. Given the point that you raised that s we are encouraging schools to develop community values, how many people in this room feel like the community values that are emerging on campuses right now are reflective of, sex of judgments on sexual assault that you're comfortable with? Or are those values being, as Pro Professor Rudofsky pointed out, are they being pulled to one extreme or the other? Just a show of hands, if, if you feel like your campus is dealing well with a conversation around sexual assault. Okay. And how many people feel like your campus is not dealing well with a conversation around sexual assault? Either way. So it's about even. L let me turn it to the audience and, and ask if there's any questions um, from the audience. Is, this is kind of a charged issue. Uh, sir, you had a hand up before. Uh, we'll bring a mic down to you. Just a second. Here it comes. Thank you. You, you asked if um, there were other approaches to changing the climate. I wonder if there's been any effort to get um, ranking organizations like US News and World Report to factor the incidence of sexual violence on campus into their rankings. That seems like something that would get the attention of many university administrations in a hurry. Really? You guys care about that? Uh, does anyone want to The ultimate care? arbitrator. <laughs> I, would, I would just say in, in that from a researcher point of view, there's a lot of um, climate surveys going on. That's one of the things that came out of the White House Task Force report. And, a lot of, and they're not apples and apples when you compare. So I think it would just be a free for all and probably, in, unless there's one standard ish, instrument. And we also know from the research is most people never disclose, and, or they disclose much later. Probably, um, we were t I was talking about this with a colleague yesterday. I get more disclosures when I'm traveling around the co um, country on an airplane or a bus than I do from the students in our college and university. And one concern, too, is reporting rates rising can be a reflection of a better culture, right, a absolutely. culture in which more victims feel comfortable. So I think there is a <laughs> tension there um, in how you'd identify the schools that were doing well versus poorly. Want to add to that? Or, no, I agree. But let me jump in. Actually, we have um, Representative uh, Daughtry from the Maine House of Representatives is on, uh, audience. I know that you sit on the Education Committee for the House of Representatives, and you've had a lot of conversations, I imagine, about this topic. Thank you. Um, one of the things we've been having conversations about from a policy perspective is maybe we put something in curriculum about what is consent and where do you start that and what does that look like? And it's something we're really struggling with as policymakers. So I guess my question for you folks is, do you think something that's coming from a state level around consent and that sort of curriculum basis would be helpful? Or what other strategies can lawmakers look at to sort of be partners in helping our college campuses with this problem? I talk about this a lot with reporters. I think that when a student walks onto campus, this cannot be the first time when they're 18 years old that they're learning about consent and bystander intervention. I think this needs to be part of the K through 12 curriculum in an age appropriate fashion. There's ways to teach about respect and to set this foundation because it shouldn't fall on the, um, camp the faculty and staff and administrators on the campuses, you know, the beginning of first year college. A way to get more sex ed into <laughs> lower schools. I, I was um, following the Owen Labrie trial in um, New Hampshire, which I'm sure some of you followed, and um, the prosecutor at the close of that trial said, we need to be doing consent education in high school and even middle school. And I thought, that's not usually the person you hear making that argument, but maybe that will um, penetrate. Can I say one thing just on the policymaker point? Um, and this is sort of self-interested, but I'm graduating in nine months, so it's not that self-interested. Uh, <laughs> Talk to students. There was one state, uh, big state bill that was proposed that I will not name, um, where the first time that student organizers were engaged with at all was when 
we got a call from the official's office asking basically who would cry on camera uh, for the press release. Uh, and I think that there are so many, this is a really hard issue, and I think that there are a lot of ways where the intuitive answers are just not the right answers, so please just engage with people on the ground. One of the other topics that's coming on the questions has to do with the UVA case, right, that was widely covered in, the ro in Rolling Stone. It's worth also noting, since we're at the New York Times, um, it, this reflects a conversation we were having last night, that that, that article would not have appeared in the New York Times. <laughs> um, but it has obviously had a huge cultural echo. Um, and a couple of people have emailed in to ask what impact you think the UVA ca case has had on this discussion, on the public perception of the discussion. And another question came in on that that said, and this was particularly um, focused on you, Alexandra, that what do you and others on the panel have to say related to claims that women are getting a biased amount of protection with these evolving policies that are so often, at least it seems to the writer, to decrease the accuser's avenues or access to defense? Often, obviously, the, the accused is male. The UVA claim alone is a prime example of the damage that can be done to an accused male's reputation or even the highly debated intense claims for the situation at Columbia University. What are your thoughts on these highly high profile events and what impact they're having on the conversation? Sure, I mean, maybe to start with the second question. Uh, the analogy that I use is that we have been living in an apartment with slanted floors for a very long time. And we set up our furniture that way and we learn to wake up in the morning and walk to the bathroom that way. And now the floor is starting to get a little more even and we feel like it's off balance. Uh, I mean, don't lie to Rolling Stone about getting raped. That's a bad thing to do. Um, and Rolling Stone also shouldn't have gone with this uncorroborated victim's account. Right, of, of course. So <laughs> I think that that's terrible. Uh, I also think it is telling that we have latched onto this one story as proof that there are lots of liars among us as opposed to seeing it as one extreme story. Uh, and so, I, again, I, I certainly take seriously concerns about process in part because we're hearing the same, a lot of the same concerns from both sides to these complaints. Um, but I think that that is different than a little bit of equality for women turns into this like uh, misandrist wonderland where women rule. I, I have to jump in really quick. I, I don't, I think something horribly happened to that victim. I don't think we know what happened to that victim, I, but I think that was the job of the Rolling Stone reporters to figure out, and they didn't do due diligence, so I don't want to refer to her as a liar. On the other hand, let me just, uh, I, I, I agree. I mean, even if those stories were wrong, uh, and in fact uh, the, the, the complaints were wrong, doesn't prove that 98% of the women who come forward aren't, uh, uh, don't have a, a valid claim, but we know there's always going to be some that are disputed. And just think about the criminal justice system in which we have much more protection, we think we do it right. What have we learned by the DNA revolution? Um, I mean, we've had 1,500 exonerations in this country. People who were convicted at trial, um, even with all these rights, um, turns out years later, DNA shows they're absolutely innocent, right? Uh, we were convinced they were guilty, we think we had it right. Um, I, I think we can never forget in this discussion, even if we're assuming, and I, I, I agree, 95% I, I, of the women who come forward, 98%, who knows? Um, uh, probably something happened, or at least they, they believe something happened, given the way we define consent. Uh, there's always be that issue. Uh, but it, when we get to those points where we've got to decide, really, uh, what happened there, uh, we, we ought to be... Um, uh, uh, we, we ought to be cautious. We've learned a lot uh, that even though we think we've got the best justice system in the world, a lot of things can go wrong. Thank you all very much. Unfortunately, we're out of time, um, but we really appreciate your time, and thank you for the fascinating conversation. Thank you all. Thank you.